I want to welcome everyone today as we shake it up a bit. We're going to take a break from our study in Hebrews before we get into the meat of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7 through chapter 10 and verse 18. And I want to talk to you about the topic of baptism. Over the last several weeks in our sister church in Kentucky... We've had several who have been baptized, and today we're going to have a baptismal service. And I was thinking about that, and I got to thinking that I've never devoted one service to a topical sermon or study or discussion on baptism. And I have to say that that's to my shame That's something that I should have done earlier on at the planning of the church because it is something that is so, so very important to us as followers of Jesus Christ. And hopefully I can explain why that is. And at the end, as always, I'll give you an opportunity to ask questions about baptism because one of the topics that I've had several questions on over the years in ministry is on this very topic. And so again, it's to my shame that I haven't covered this and produced something that we can point people to if they have questions on baptism. So if you have questions or you've had questions about this topic and I don't answer them in the sermon, please take the time to ask the question at the end and I'll do my best to give you a satisfactory answer. So let's talk about baptism and its importance, what it means to us as Christians, and why it is a part of what we do or what we are commanded to do as followers of Christ. What's interesting about baptism is It's one of two ordinances of the church or sacraments of the church or rituals or ceremonies. Any of those words would be fitting. So as a church, we've been given only two ordinances. One of them is baptism. And the other one is what? Communion. Communion. And so we have two ordinances that have been given to us as the church. Now, that is surprising if you're a first century Jew because how many ceremonies or rituals did they observe? Like, anyone ever read through the book of Leviticus? Countless rituals and ceremonies that they observed that they had to remember in a time where they didn't have access to the actual writing of it. So they had to remember all of this stuff. Lots of ceremonies and rituals. But as Christians, we have been called to observe two ordinances in the church. Communion, which was done in the early church on a weekly basis as they met in homes. And then baptism which was something that was not to be observed on a daily or weekly basis, like the rituals of the Old Covenant, but one time. Baptism is a one-time event, an occurrence, that should happen in the lives of all those who choose to become followers of Jesus Christ. Now, let me define this term, and I have two lexicons that we're going to look at their definition And this one is the BDAG lexicon, one of the most standard uh, Greek lexicons. But this is what it says as far as the definition. It is the ceremonious use of water for the purpose of renewing or establishing a relationship with God. An extraordinary experience akin to an initiatory Purification, right. I don't know why that word's so hard for me to say, but I I stumble every time I say it. I even practice it because it's so hard and still butchered it. Initiatory purification, right. Here's what Lexham Bible Dictionary, the one produced by Logos Bible Software, this is their definition. The act of washing in water as a part of a purification ritual. The rite 
of formal initiation into the Christian church through waters. Those are base definitions that are relative to what we're going to see and experience today in the ritual that we will observe, and that is Christian baptism. But what's interesting about baptism is that it is a predominantly New Testament idea. By saying that, we only find the verb form of the word baptize twice in the Septuagint, only two times. One occurrence is in Isaiah, and the other one is in the story of Naaman the leper when he went and dipped in the river seven times, immersed himself in the river seven times. Those are the only two occurrences of the verb. There are zero occurrences in, in the Old Testament, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Zero occurrences of the noun, baptism. What is striking about that is that the verb occurs 80 times in the New Testament and, and the noun 22 times. But even though the word of the term was not developed to what we know as Christians and the use of it in Christian baptism, the concept was very much known not only to uh, the Jewish community in which it was birthed, but also in the religious use throughout the ancient Near East and even more broadly throughout the world. Most religions then and now have some form of ceremonial or ritual washings or cleansing rituals that they engage in. Now, for our study, I want to mention some of what we see in the Old Testament as far as water-type ceremonies. Um, the priests were washed in water, and the Levites were sprinkled with water at their initiation ceremony when they would step into an office within the Israelite community, within the priesthood. So the priests were washed, the Levites were sprinkled. And this is why, this is part of the reason why in some Christian traditions they will, they will sprinkle instead of full immersion because of what it is tied to or linked to in antiquity in the Jewish observances. And so their, their mindset is, well, if it was acceptable, you know, in Jewish practice, why not in Christian practice? And we'll, we'll discuss that more later on, and you may have questions in relation to that. There was the copper laver in front of the tabernacle and, and the temple that the priest used to wash their hands and their feet before performing the sacrifices for the people. The high priest on the Day of Atonement, would bathe himself fully several times and change clothes several times as he performed the ceremonies of that day as he went into the most holy place, the only day that he actually went into the most holy place. The ashes of the red heifer were mixed with water and sprinkled on anyone to purify them if they had come in contact with a corpse. There were washings or cleansing if a person had leprosy or any form of skin disease. There were ceremonial washings that they had to perform. After intercourse, any contact with menstruation, and also after birth, there were ceremonial washings that took place in each of those accounts. So the concept of a ritual of, of a washing of water was not a new concept as far as the actual practice and the use of water in these rituals. So these rituals were observed for 1,400 years in the Israelite community. And then when you get to the Gospels, when you look into the Gospels, you see a man jump onto the scene who introduces us to the term that we see in the New Testament called baptism. 
And that person is John the Baptist. It would be kind of hard to overlook him. John the Baptist, right? So John the Baptist came on the scene. And we need to understand the difference between the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus or the baptism that's associated with Christianity. The baptism of John functioned primarily for the Israelite people. And it functioned in a way that it was a call to repentance. At that time in the first century, the Jewish nation was very unfaithful to God. They were compromising from every angle. And John came on the scene as a fulfillment to the Isaiah prophecy and also Malachi's prophecy where he would be a forerunner to the Messiah who would prepare the hearts of the people for Jesus. How many of you know the Jewish people needed their hearts prepared for the rabbi named Jesus when he came on the scene? Because he was radical. He was in your face. He was abrasive. And he would not back down from confrontation or from controversy. Matter of fact, his, old, his entire ministry uh, had controversy that surrounded it. And so the Jewish people needed to prepare their heart. And they prepared their heart through repentance. Which is why John the Bab Baptist, his baptism was called the baptism of repentance. But also associated with that was the concept of the forgiveness of sins. So you have repentance, forgiveness of sins, the preparing of one's heart in the Jewish community for the Messiah. Because when John makes that declaration and he's baptizing in the Jordan River, the Messiah is very near. And he comes on the scene very quickly after the time of John the Baptist's ministry. Matter of fact, John the Baptist's ministry only lasted for probably at most a year and a half into Jesus' ministry. And then as he himself predicted and prophesied, he would decrease and Christ would increase. And Christ would overtake John's ministry and the rest is history. But in John's uh, baptism, you have the elements of repentance, forgiveness of sins, Preparation for the Messiah. But he was also trying to demonstrate for the Jewish people, ethnicity means squat to God as far as covenant relationship goes. In other words, John was trying to tell the Jewish people, just because you were born a Jew doesn't mean you're in covenant standing or in right standing with God. You can go through the motions, you can go through the rituals and not have true repentance and you're not in covenant with God. And that's what he was trying to do in preparation for the Messiah. Now, Jesus comes on the scene. And while Jesus was here, Jesus did not baptize. And Jesus' disciples were not instructed to baptize during his earthly ministry. And there is some overlap with John. So there was the baptism of John for, for a season but Jesus did not formally instruct the disciples to go out baptizing, and he did not introduce the baptism that is associated with his name to his disciples. But what is interesting is that Jesus himself partook in John's baptism, which is, it really backs us into a corner and should cause us to ask questions, well, why was Jesus baptized? It was a baptism of repentance, it was a baptism to prepare the hearts of the Jewish people for the Messiah. Well, he is the Messiah. He hasn't sinned. He doesn't need to repent. And so his baptism was kind of a bridge between John's baptism and what would follow in Christian baptism after Jesus would be here. And, and you have to go to the Gospels and read the accounts of his baptism, and I think you'll see what I'm trying to say here as it being a bridge, because what we see in the baptismal scene of Jesus is, first of all, it would validate John's baptism. It would validate that John indeed was the fulfillment to the Isaiah and the, and the Malachi prophecy as being the forerunner to the Messiah. It would also validate the need for the Jewish people 
even though they're ethnic Jews, to repent, to fall on their face before God and realize that they needed a heart transformation that would take place with the new covenant and the Messiah who would bring forth the new covenant. It also showed the link between what would follow thereafter in Christian baptism between the Spirit and baptism. How they are interconnected and interlinked because when Jesus was baptized, what do the Gospels say happened? The Spirit ascended on Him like a dove. And what else happened? The declaration of God from heaven declaring the sonship of Christ. Be Behold my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so there was a validation for John the Baptist's ministry and also for Jesus and His ministry. The baptism of Jesus also served as an initiation rite for His ministry because He would become, as Hebrews has told us thus far, and we're about to get into the meat of that, He, he became the high priest. He was the royal son. He was the heir to God's throne who would be seated at His right hand, ruling the cosmos. And so we have that aspect involved in that he was being anointed at his baptismal. Ceremonial washing, preparation for ministry, and the anointing, the, the, the Spirit descending, represents God's anointing for ministry as he would go on to have a ministry for three and a half years. Now that brings us to Christian baptism, which was commanded by Jesus in Matthew chapter 28. And this is the, if we were to ask the question, why, 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 why do we do baptism? Here's the short answer. Jesus, before he leaves this planet in the ascension, says to his apostles, whom he had chosen to take the gospel to the rest of the world. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations or students. How many students do we have out there? How many of you were in, in, in the scripture this week? Okay. If you weren't, you're not a student. <laughs> not a hearer, a doer, a student. Go and make students of all nations but along with that, by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we see that Jesus clearly commanded the apostles to institute what we know as Christian baptism. And it was something that all Christians were to participate in and to do as followers of Jesus Christ. And so that is the obvious short answer to why we have Christian baptism. But we also know, based on historical writings, the Didache and other various writings, as well as the rest of the New Testament, it served as an initiation ceremony, an initiation rite for those who had made a decision to become followers of Christ. And it was an outward demonstration of an inward repentance that had taken place in their hearts. And it also captured what is associated with baptism, and that is the forgiveness of sins. Just like John's baptism, the forgiveness of sins in the sacrifice of Christ is associated with baptism, as is the reception of the Spirit, which the book of Acts tries to capture very well. It also shows us the fundamental belief, the beginning belief, the initial salvation, if you will, of Christians, and that is the acceptance of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. In the immersion ceremony, you have the going under, which represents the death, and the coming out, that represents the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that serves as a paradigm for his followers. It, it, is, it pays tribute to the fact 
that we look back retrospectively, especially now, to what Christ did in his death, burial, and resurrection. And that also has not only a past reality where our initial salvation reflects on what he has done, it also has a right now, a present application, and we're going to look at some scriptures here in just a moment, that show that we see ourselves as having died with Christ in baptism. What have we died to? Sin. What else? The flesh. The world or the world system. And we have, not, not only did we die to those things, the rudiments of this world, the elements of this world, but we have been raised to new, not, new life, so we walk in a new life in Christ. What does it mean that we walk in a, new, in a new way or a new life in Christ? It's a moral or an ethical transformation process that begins in us as we become followers of Christ. And this is something that we should continually grow in until we leave this earth because we're looking at the person of Jesus, we're looking at His life, we're absorbing His teaching, and we're allowing all of that to have the greatest influence on our own lives. And in that process, we're putting to death, as Colossians says, we're mortifying or putting to death deeds of the flesh, things that do not please God, things that are, are damning or damaging to us as human beings. We are putting them to death and we are allowing Christ to transform our behavior. The way we think, the way we see life, the way we process and engage in relationship, it transcends into every part of our lives. So there's a present tense motif that's captured in baptism. But also, there's a future hope that is captured in baptism. And that is, just as Christ died, was buried, and was raised from the dead, you and I, as followers of Christ, have that same hope in that even if we die, even if we're not here when Christ returns, we have the hope that one day, like He, we too will be raised from the dead in the consummation of this salvation process and we will be glorified and we will be just as Christ was. And that is captured in baptism very well. Baptism also served as, you know, in being an initiatory rite as a replacement for the initiatory rite of Judaism. Judaism, how many of you know that Judaism had an initiation rite? If you were not born a Jew and you wanted to be converted to Judaism and serve the one true and living God, Yahweh, if you were a male to be a full-fledged convert to Judaism, you had to be what? Circumcised. And circumcision was something that was instituted as a covenant marker for the Jewish people. And it's something that reflected an inward reality. Circumcision, outward circumcision, the actual physical act, was something they had to do. But it, in and of itself, didn't make them in right standing with God. It had to be embodied internally. It had to be accompanied by a heart that had been circumcised. What does it mean to have a circumcised heart? A heart that is sensitive to God. A heart that will bow to the Creator, realizing their role as being created by the Creator, and willing to accept His Word and trust Him. And trust His Word. And being willing to allow one's thinking to be shaped and formed and influenced by God and not a pagan society or the world. 
fill in the blank there with a, a lot of different terms. For Paul, in Paul's writings, you may have overlooked this, but if we reflect on our series in Corinth, Paul referred to baptism as a call to unity and an abstinence from disunity. Because as an initiation rite, they were baptized into Christ, into the body of Christ, and being baptized in the body of Christ, how many bodies are there? One body, many members, and so there's a call to unity. That's why he went into that discourse. Were any of you baptized in, in my name or in Apollos or fill in the blank? No, we were all come to the faith in and through Jesus, and they were trying to bring division in the church at Corinth because a lot of them liked Apollos and his preaching style. Some of them liked Paul. Some of them liked others. And there was a division on personality and so he used that as a means to call them to unity saying that we were baptized into one body and that body is the body of jesus christ and all eyes need to be on him and no one else and so it's a call to unity so let's look at some issues that we have if you want to call them issues because we read in matthew where jesus said to go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But when you get to the book of Acts, you have a different writer who has a different agenda, who expresses himself in verbiage that probably, if we were to pick one author that has caused, I don't want to say caused, let me retract that, that there has been a lot of misunderstanding because of his writing style, it would be Luke. And especially Acts. Acts is so misunderstood, especially in, in, in modern church culture, because they do not understand the rhetorical and literary strategy of Luke, and they don't understand his verbiage because, you know, it's not investigated as far as a literary piece, what it is, a historiography. But in Acts, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out, and this is when the Great Commission was to take off because Jesus told them, wait in Jerusalem, you'll be endued with power from on high, and that's when you begin the Great Commission, go make disciples of all people and baptize them. So it did not take place before the day of Pentecost. But on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit... Uh, came upon the followers of Jesus who were gathered at the Temple Mount. They weren't in the upper room. They were in the Temple Mount where every Jew would have been on the day of Pentecost. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, which was God's way of showing the Jewish nation that temple, the temple, the physical structure, is no longer the place that will house the presence of God. God's presence has been removed from that physical temple and it has been given to the church, the followers of Jesus Christ, which is why Jesus said, where, where two or three are gathered in my name, in my teaching, in, in who he is, there I, there I am in their midst. And so they're gathered there, they receive the Holy Spirit, the gathered Jewish community from the diaspora had come to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. Master plan of God. Master plan of God to get the Great Commission going. Bring everyone to Jerusalem for the feast. Pour out your spirit. They'll begin to speak in all the languages of all the people that are gathered there. It'll be an undeniable manifestation of God's power in that His Word is declared in every language that is represented there. And Peter takes advantage of the occasion, and he preaches. And towards the end of that, go home and read that whole chapter if you wish. He says, and Peter said to them, because they say, what do we need to do? What, 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 how do we respond to this? This is news to us. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of 
the Holy Spirit. What is the gift of the Holy Spirit? This is a genitive of apposition for you grammar nerds. A genitive, the genitive case, Greek genitive case, a genitive of apposition, which means that the gift is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the gift. So, and that's a representation of the new covenant. You'll be a participant in the new covenant. But notice what is said there. Repent and be baptized. How? In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, time out. Reasonably, if you read this on a literal face value level, you step back and you're like, okay, Jesus said to make disciples and to baptize them. And he gives them the ceremonial pronouncement in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then you come to the book of Acts and it says, baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. So which is it? This has caused a lot of controversy in the church too, by the way. A lot of controversy. And it's really unnecessary if you understand Luke's strategy and what he's trying to do here. And this is where it helps to read through all of Acts and then come back to this and it will help you process what you read in chapter 2. Especially when you get to the latter part of Acts chapter 18 and the first part of Acts chapter 19, what Luke is clearly trying to do in saying it this way is to bring a distinction between the baptism that Jesus instructed and the baptism of John. And, and don't, don't take my word for it. I double dog dare you to go read the latter part of Acts 18 and the first part of Acts chapter 19 and you'll see what I'm saying. He did not want there to be a misunderstanding that the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus were the same thing. So when he says it this way, that they are to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, he is saying that they are to be baptized in Jesus' baptism, not in John's baptism. The baptism that is associated with Jesus, and we know from our Exodus series, Exodus chapter 20, that the name doesn't rep represent just the name. It represents the person, the character, and the teaching of that person involved. And the teaching of Jesus, if we are to go back to his name, and back to Matthew chapter 28, his point-blank instructions were to baptize how? In the name of the Father, the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this in our baptismal services. I cover all the bases for the oneness and the tr Trinitarians. I say, I baptize you through the, theor through the authority of Jesus' name, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That way, everybody's happy and, and it's all covered. Even though, like, let me say this. And, and I'll say this at the outset. Understanding the Trinity is like, you think about it and you just have to go lay down. It's just really complicated. And I don't claim to say that I fully grasp or understand it. I'm waiting one day to, to hopefully understand it better. But in the oneness camp, when I say the oneness camp, I'm talking about those who believe in what is called modalism, where they believe that God just takes on different forms. Um, if that's true, then if we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, if you say those are all of the same person, what's the problem? They say, well, you've got to use Jesus' name because it has to be in Jesus' name. Well, if Jesus is the Father and Jesus is the Son and Jesus is the Holy Spirit, like, aren't we talking about the same dude? Right? You're like straining at a gnat there. Uh, not that I agree with their position and how they view it. I don't believe in modalism. I believe in three distinct persons that work together as one triune God. Um, their argument kind of falls on its face when you really probe into it. Um, so that's one issue that has been a problem in the church. because, And it's because of the reading of Acts. If we didn't have Acts, I don't want to say this. Because I believe it's inspired by God and it's given by God. But if we didn't have Acts, 
we would have avoided a lot of bad theology in the church. We really would. Um, I could elaborate on that, but this is where you got to be a competent student and you got to get into the fun stuff, the, the linguistics, the, the literary features of the writings and the purposes of the authors. And, and you got to understand where they're coming from and who they're writing to and the things they're trying to hash out in the first century. If we don't do that, we're going to come to faulty conclusions that we see in the charismatic and Pentecostal movements based on a over-literalized, misunderstood reading of the book of Acts. And it's just unnecessary if we're good students. But then that's the problem in and of itself right there. So, how should we be baptized? What is the pronouncement? According to Jesus... How many of you think we should kind of go with Jesus? If Jesus is Lord, I'm going with Jesus. Jesus said in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which captures, I forgot to mention this earlier, but at Jesus' baptism, you have all three involved. The Father is speaking from heaven, Jesus is being baptized, and the Holy Spirit is descending. If they're all the same person, like, did Jesus morph out of his body, go speak from heaven, and then descend on himself and, and become himself before he ascended on himself? Are you guys with me? This is how my mind thinks about these things. I'm like, no, no, it can't be. So it captures the triune God in that statement. It's a recognition, and it's reflecting back on Jesus' own baptism, okay, and the process that led to it. Am I making sense? Okay, so we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's associated with Jesus' name. It's associated with Jesus' teaching. It's not John's baptism. That is the whole point of the last five minutes, what I tried to say. He goes on and says, For the promise is to you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort or encourage them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. I would like to have every, all the other things that he said to that audience, being a Jewish audience, um, but we don't have it. But he did go into a lengthy teaching. You guys think I'm long-winded? You should have hung out with Jesus or the apostles. They would preach and teach all day long. So you're welcome. He said, save yourself from this crooked generation and watch what happens. So those who received his word, what does it mean they received his word? They agreed with him. They consented to what he said and and received it as absolute and binding truth. So, who should be baptized? Everyone who believes that what the apostles taught is true. Well, how do we know what they taught? Like today. We have their writings. Now, then they didn't. They had to go off what they had heard at that time. But we need to, if we're going to be baptized, we need to be familiarized with what the apostles taught. It's the witness of Christ. And we need to be willing to say, I agree with that. I may not fully understand it, but I agree with it. I'm not going to refute it or gainsay it. And I'm going, the parts that I don't understand, I'm going to try to understand. Even if understanding doesn't come on this side. And so they did. They received his word and were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Which is a significant number because when the Mosaic Law was given and they're worshiping the idol... How many died? 3,000. 3,000 died with the giving of the law. 3,000 were saved with the giving of the new law, the law of Christ, the Spirit. And that's what they're trying to capture there in that statement. 
I mentioned earlier, it's a call to unity. This is what Paul says to the church at Corinth. For in one spirit, through one teaching, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And all were made to drink of one spirit. And so as those who are baptized, we need to all be on common ground in our acceptance of God's word as binding truth that will then take precedence and governance over each of our lives. In other words, this is what God's word says and means. This is what we're going to go with as we walk out our journey here on earth. Paul says this in Galatians 3, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, into the body of Christ, you have put on Christ. What does it mean to put on Christ? The NET captures this. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You have taken His yoke, if you will. You have taken the yoke of Christ upon you, and you are clothed in Christ, which means you put into practice what He has taught. That's why you have garments and clothing serves as a metaphor for righteous deeds, which is a proper or obedient response to Jesus. So, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ or you have made a choice to obey Christ from here forth. Romans chapter 6 in verse 3 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized, how many of them were baptized? All. So how many Christians should be baptized? All. Now, there are... Let me pause for just a moment. There are a lot of denominations that will tell you you don't have to be baptized to be a Christian. Is that true or false? False. You do have to be baptized to be a Christian if you have the opportunity. And usually the non-sequitur argument that is used to defend that faulty position is, well, the thief wasn't baptized, so I guess he's not in heaven. Sit down, Susie, and I'm going to try to talk nice to you. Did the thief have an opportunity to be baptized? No. If Jesus and the thief were to have gotten down from the cross... Would Jesus have expected the thief to get baptized? Yes. Otherwise, his command to everyone else is null and void. Furthermore, the thief discourse occurs before Pentecost. And Christian baptism was not instituted before Pentecost. So it really doesn't matter anyway. Um, but the point is, the thief was nailed to a cross. Of course he didn't get baptized. He couldn't. It was impossible. But for anyone who has made an authentic decision, a lifetime decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ, should be baptized and should be baptized as quickly as possible. When you read through the account of Acts, when they came to an understanding. I think there needs to be a time of processing and understanding what you're agreeing to. But I think once that happens, a decision needs to made, be made quickly to be baptized because it is the first command that is given to a Christian to be baptized. So that's why he says here, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death. He gets into the imagery of what it represents. We've been baptized into His death. We have died with Him. We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death in order that... How many of you think when you see that phrase, something important will follow? In order that in the result being, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
we too might walk in newness of life. Again, this is the present reality of what baptism is saying and what the actual uh, baptism, what it represents is that we have made a decision to die with Christ and be raised with Him, and that's going to transform every part of the rest of our lives as we walk life out. And so we walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly, and this is a really good promise, be united with Him in a resurrection like His. So it's forward-looking to the hope that we have and the hope which we should all fix our eyes on, and that is the consummation of the kingdom and the resurrection. Just like Christ was raised, we will be raised. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him. What is our old self? Our flesh, our sinful life, our worldly life was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that, so that, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So He's freed us from sin. Not only has He forgiven our sin, but He's empowered us to go and sin no more. As we see in the Gospels. Not that we're going to be perfect and we're not going to possibly sin. But we have been empowered that it no longer enslaves us. We're not habitually stumbling in the same old sin day after day like we were before conversion. For one who has died with Christ has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. Again, there's the future hope and the future promise. Now, I want to go back to another passage in 1 Peter. And in, I encourage you to read this context. And this is the, the problem of topical teaching, is you, you have to like read chapters and chapters, which people can't endure, or you have to like just pull verses in isolation, and uh, it just bugs me. But in this context, it's talking about how the flood in Noah's day saved Noah and his family. Water was a type of salvation. So let me say this about baptism. Baptism has a literal sense where you have the actual rite of baptism, immersion in water, but it also has a metaphorical sense. Salvation is something, it's a metaphor, but also what's another thing? Persecution and martyrdom. Remember what Jesus said in his, he said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how much of a strait am I in until it is accomplished? What was he referring to? His death and crucifixion and the persecution leading up to that. But here, in the context of the flood and how waters represents salvation, he says there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. And he explains, not the actual ceremony. It, in and of itself, doesn't save you. Because the ceremony has to be accompanied with what? What the ceremony represents. And the ceremony represents a belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. A transformation and a new life that results from that and a hope of the resurrection. So, he says... And that saves us. That covers all three tenses of salvation that we talked about in our series in Ephesians. You guys remember that? The three tenses of salvation in Ephesians chapter 2. And that's what baptism captures and articulates. And that saves us. No one of them standing alone saves us. All three of them together do. We must believe in His death, burial, and resurrection. We must live in a transformed way. And we must have the hope of the resurrection. A Resurrection like Christ. That, all of that together, saves us. 
And it's all captured by baptism. So baptism, and he has to explain this because there are literalists there too, not the removal of the, of the filth of the flesh, like not the, the actual water and the cleansing of the water. It, it's not what actually saves you, but what it represents. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. A sincere and humble heart that is responding in a good conscience to God in the ways that I described. Accepting His death, burial, resurrection. Living a transformed life and the hope of the resurrection. And all of that started with what? As the last part of the verse says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's all possible. Why? Because of Jesus. And so baptism captures all all of those realities. And, and he goes on to say, who has gone into the heaven is the right hand of God. I threw this in there because of our Hebrews series that is showing Jesus at the right hand of God and his sonship. Who has gone into the heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Now, one last thing in Scripture that I want to capture that baptism is related to is, in a functional sense, a replacement for circumcision. I mentioned it earlier, but here's the verses. And I, how many of you went and listened to Colossians 2? If you did, I'm going to be brief. You already got it because I talked about it in more detail there. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Well, what is that? By putting off the body of the flesh... By the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So, circumcision is no longer a initiation rite for God's covenant people. What has replaced it? Baptism, which means that baptism is very... Very important. So, let me ask you some questions. Is baptism necessary? Yes. Is it mandatory? Yes. Is it optional? No. Okay. Why do we do it? Simplest answer? Jesus said to. That's good enough. The Lord... And what's interesting about that is... One of the things that they confessed in the early church at their baptism, especially within an empire that was dominated by Rome and the rule of Caesar, whom they titled Lord, was the declaration, Jesus is Lord, which was polemical, saying at the same time, Caesar is not Lord, and I'm not going to bow to Caesar, even if I have to give my life. So they would say Jesus is Lord, and that was something that, accompanied their baptisms. Who can be baptized? People who have consented to the truth that has been proclaimed by the apostles and the eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. Now, in some traditions, there is infant baptism. And as a postmodern, we're like, why are they baptizing infants? Well, if you remember what baptism was taken from, the ceremonial washings, and you understand also that it is a replacement for a covenant initiation rite, what did they do to every Jewish male boy? They circumcised them. And so their train of thought was, well, if baptism replaces circumcision and they circumcise babies, why aren't we baptizing babies? You see, you see how they made the connection? Now, I do not think that that is satisfactory in the sense that if that child grows up to become of an age of accountability and they make a decision to follow Christ, they should not look back to that baptism and it be sufficient. They should proceed with an actual baptism. Um, 
But at the same time, I can't say, oh, that's damning. You shouldn't baptize a baby because I see the connection. I think it's a faulty connection, but I can see how the connection was made. And at the end of the day, the baby got a bath. So there you go. <laughs> I mean, the, it wasn't the baby's fault. The baby didn't have no power in the matter. Uh, but that is not the purpose of Christian baptism. I hope you understand and you're tracking with me. So how should it be done? Let's talk about first what should be pronounced. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we explain that. But how should it be done? Should it be done by immersion? By pouring water on your head? Or by sprinkling? Why do I mention all three of those? Because all three of them were part of the ritual and ceremonial practices of the Jewish community. And so you could see why some said, okay, this is a, an accepting form to sprinkle or to pour water on the head. Now, this is going to surprise you. You have access to this. This is called the Didache. And it, and it is a handbook that was given... Two Christians by the apostles, dated to the first century, okay? And it specifically spells out some things about baptism. And it says that concerning baptism, you rehearsed all, all things, right? You, you give them sound teaching. And then you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And in the, the first century, the preference was it was to be done in running water. You have to understand in the first century... Water sources weren't available by turning on a tap, okay? So depending on where the community is, the, the water that was available to them was sparse in some cases. Why did they prefer running water? What is running water? Moving water, like a river or a stream that has flowing water, because they considered running water to be living water. And they wanted baptism to be associated with life because that's what it represents, the coming up, a walking in new life. And so that was the point of the preference. It wasn't mandatory, though, that it had to be running water. And how many of you are thankful today we're not doing it in running water? Because you know what happens when you do it in running water? It's cold. Running water is always cold water. And so they actually had a preference for cold water. Running water, cold water. But if you have no running water, baptize in other water. And if you cannot in cold, then in warm. What's the point? Just find some stinking water. Find the best water you have and get in it and do it. Now, what if, but if you have neither, but if you have neither, what if you don't have water that you can be immersed in? Well, you just don't get to, you just miss out. You just don't get to participate. You just can't be a part of the covenant people. You have no water. They didn't travel like we do. What water they had around them is what they had to use. And if you don't have a river or a stream or a mud puddle or anything like that, what do you do? Here's what he says. What it says. You pour water three times on the head in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So you make the best use of what you have. And in some cases, I, I think you could press that even, even further if you didn't have three full cups of water to pour on someone's head, and you just had one cup, you just, you just sprinkle them. You make the best of what you have. God is not straining at a gnat in this. He sees our heart first and foremost, okay? And we need to understand that. And more than the actual physical dunking in water, we need to have everything it represents taking place in our hearts. I will go on to say this, and I should have posted this in the group. And before the baptism, baptism, let the baptizer and him who is to be baptized fast and any others who are able. I did fast. I didn't tell you guys who are being baptized to fast, so that's not your fault. I, I should have told you this is something they, they said to do. And you shall bid him who is to be baptized to fast one or two days before. So how many of you are glad I didn't tell you to? <laughs> but I didn't eat today for, for your sake to do this. 
So, that's how it should be done. We've talked about what it means. We've talked about some of the issues. Some of you may have questions about other issues that are related to baptism. Um, the preferred method is immersion. That's what we will do today. And the water is warm. So, you'll appreciate that, I'm sure. Um, any questions? If you have a question, raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic. So raise. For the last couple of years, I have thought about being rebaptized because when I was baptized, I was 12 when I was baptized, and my mom decided that she and my sister and I would be baptized. It wasn't my choice. Um, there was no counseling. I didn't even know what it meant. I mean, I knew kind of what it meant, but not as a complete change in the way I live my life. What you, I, I can't find anything that says, yes, you should, no, you shouldn't. I find lots of opinions, but what do you think? The biblical paradigm is to follow a true conversion with baptism. Do you think you experienced a true conversion that was rooted in a proper understanding? If not, you should be baptized. There are probably others that would be in that same camp. I, I grew up in church. And, like, every time we went to the lake as a kid, I was getting baptized. I was like, I want to be baptized too. Looking back, that shouldn't have been allowed, honestly, because in the earliest examples, I, I didn't understand, even though I could quote probably more memory verses than half the church at a young, young age. I didn't understand. I really hadn't matured to the level of understanding that was needed to be baptized. And that's something that I rehearsed with some that are being baptized today, I wanted to make sure um, that those being baptized understood they made an authentic decision. There's true and genuine repentance um, because without that, what we're about to do means absolutely nothing. And so it's very, very important. Another thing about baptism is it makes us accountable. It is a public demonstration that we are followers of Christ and at the same time, we're saying I'm accountable to all of you here because we're all one body. Any other questions? Really? No questions on baptism. You guys feel like you understand the concept, why, and all that? Okay, we're going to stop the recording this time, and we're going to get to...